And we're recording now. Everyone, I want you to meet my dear friend, Jamie Dorman. She is such a great makeup artist. I love working with her. We've done several jobs together. Um, she has really, really great style, taste, good work, great work, amazing work. And she is just a lot of fun to talk to and just kind of one of my favorite people. Everyone, Jamie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am Jamie, as stated. I am a celebrity makeup artist in New York City. I started my career in LA. I did a couple of seasons of America's Next Top Model. And since being in New York, it's kind of been a mixture of editorial, press junkets, um, just celebrities attending things, that kind of kept that, that sort of thing. That's cool. I didn't know that you started in LA. You're from Boston originally, right? Am I right about that? Yes, yes. I'm originally from like right outside of Boston oh, and cool. my family have very thick accents. So <laughs> I like if it pops out, I'm tired. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. What made you choose to try and start things in LA? What was the draw to LA? I was dating someone who lived in San Diego at the time and I didn't go to LA to intentionally start a career in makeup. I actually went to study music. Really? So, yeah, my degree is actually in guitar performance. So <laughs> completely know. unrelated. <laughs> That's amazing. So how did you get into makeup then? It was an accident. I am. Um, <laughs> I lived in this apartment building in Hollywood, like right by the Chinese theater. And I, it was like a courtyard style, like Melrose Place kind of situation where like everybody was in each other's business. It was like, everybody like was a community in that building. Mm. And I had a neighbor who um, kind of worked for a a clothing label downtown. And I say worked for in the sense that I, anybody who lives in LA knows that if you live in LA, like the way people make money doesn't make sense. <laughs> sure. Like if, if you look at people's jobs and then look at like how much brunch they eat, like the, <laughs> the, true. the true. economy of LA doesn't make actual sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's based <laughs> on how many Pharrell hats they sell. Like if everyone's got a Pharrell had a brunch. <laughs> yes, yes. That, that it's, it's almost like that South Park where they're like, um, the, the gnomes that steal underwear, where they're like, step one, steal underwear, step three, profit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, LA is weird. I mean, New York is, is somewhat like that too, but LA is like on a whole other level. It is, it is. Yeah, yeah. I find myself at coffee shops all the time looking around going, what do these people do for a living? Yes. And I feel like it makes a little more sense in this city. Like you can follow the money trail a bit easier here than you can in LA. That's so funny. Oh my God. That's amazing. So he worked <laughs> at a denim, a denim company, was it? Is that right? It was like a clothing company okay. um, in downtown LA. And so um, within this building, like there's just like a cast of characters. There's like um a rapper who was signed to Universal and there was like Mrs. White and her fat cat and like across from my unit there was this old black woman named Bibi who was always high <laughs> and she had this beautiful table outside of her unit such a lovely woman and she like people gathered at her table and they would drink wine and they would smoke and people got to know each other and that is how I got to know this neighbor of mine who worked at this clothing label and so after about like three months of like getting to know each other periodically at BB's table, which honestly should be the name of the show about this whole portion of my life. Uh, he was like, oh, you know a lot about makeup and your makeup always looks great. You should be a makeup artist. And I was like, don't be ridiculous. I'm gonna finish up this guitar performance degree. I'm gonna go on tour with Rihanna. This is the plan for my life. And eventually- plan he, too, though. <laughs> this was the great, what I didn't know was the plan B. <laughs> <laughs> so he invites me to the shoot. Um, and I just remember being like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I, like I had everything I needed somehow. I had like palettes and stuff and brushes. I just threw out like the period of time leading up to this. I had been buying these sort of things just for fun. Wow. And so I get there and the makeup artist doesn't show up. And 
I don't know like the etiquette of set at this point. So I just kind of start doing makeup and nobody knows the makeup artist isn't there because I'm doing the makeup and they're like, Oh, Jamie, you're a really good makeup artist. How long have you been doing makeup? And I'm like, Oh, like a year. And they believed me. (laughs) That's okay. Go on. (laughs) (laughs) So, So I just kind of like kept like, after this, I like put like some images up online and I just started booking shoots and I kept saying this lie. Like I've been doing makeup for a year every time people ask until it got to the point where I was like, oh, it has been a year. Now I can stop lying. (laughs) People are like, hasn't it been two years? You're like, no. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. People who are doing the math, they're like, I can't keep up. That is so funny. How crazy. That is a real, that is, I think that's one of my favorite stories I've heard yet of how people have gotten into this business. That's so wacky. And you went right into like doing photo shoots. It's not like you were doing makeup at a store or something. You like went right to the deep end of the pool. I couldn't get a job in a store. After I d- had done that shoot, I was like, oh, maybe I should pursue this. And I started applying at like Mac counters and like Edward Best and like nobody would hire me. So I just, I had to get freelance jobs and I had to get assisting jobs because nobody would hire me. Wow. And... <laughs> It, ironically, like it was a, it was a real struggle at first. I remember just like not being able to afford like more than $20 of groceries a week at that point. Yeah, and it just, I remember eating a lot of plantain chips. <laughs> <They're> very inexpensive. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if I hadn't been through that time and I had been through like an easier time financially, I wouldn't have been put in a position where like I had to hustle to just get as much assisting work. And like, I, like, I can't even tell you all the, like the weird B horror films that I did. Really? <laughs> yeah. Just like the, the most ridiculous like plots to these horror films. And, and honestly, those, that's the bread and butter of a makeup artist, like fresh out of school or something. Wow. And I guess, especially in LA, cause they do so many movies, like they, it, that's a smaller, that's a smaller business here in New York, but in LA, it's probably predominantly film, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, ironically, I like moved to New York because I wanted to be an editorial makeup artist and I didn't like doing celebrity in LA. Wow. And then within the past couple years, my work has been mostly celebrity. And I was like, oh, I guess it wasn't the celebrity, it was the city. Fair, fair. And honestly, the work in New York has shifted to just everything. The business in general has shifted to be very celebrity oriented anyway, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think like we've seen that a lot, like starting maybe, especially in the 2000s with like celebrities taking over campaign jobs and now it kind of being like a cult of personality. So it's a different type of celebrity where people, it's not necessarily about their talent or just about their talent, but like, do people feel connected to a person? That's true. That's true. That is very interesting how that's happened. People end up really feeling not just a a sense of connection to them, but there's also this a a feeling that they really know them, even though they don't, but because they follow them on Instagram, there's a feeling that there's some sort of connection that they have with this person who does not know who they are at all. Yeah. And I think that um, more and more, I see millennials and Gen Z being very perceptive about what is authentic online Mm. and more and more um, savvy about knowing what celebrities are clearly just getting a paycheck from representing a brand and which ones it actually feels authentic to their brand and to something that they would actually use and like aside from that. Yeah, that is true. I have to say you're right. I do feel like this next this current generation of young people is a bit more switched on. They're not, you know, it's not like, um, like it, for us years ago, if like a celebrity was selling us like a VCR or something, it would have been like, I rolled our eyes and just thought, well, it's a paycheck for them. But now it's almost that seen as a negative. You know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I like <laughs> remember buying Veet just because Alyssa Milano was the face of it. And That campaign from like the early 2000s, I still buy Veet because of Alyssa Milano. No kidding. She (laughs) turned you into a loyal customer. She really did. It's (laughs) it's effective. Yeah. Alyssa Milano, if you're watching, thank you. (laughs) Thank you. My legs have never been smoother. (laughs) (laughs) 
That is fantastic. I love that. So wait, how long have you been in New York then? It's been about six years now. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, you still do a ton of fashion work, even though I know that's been primarily celebrity, but how do you feel, um, what have you been doing this last past year since it's been so crazy and weird to stay inspired or to stay on your game or, or to feel like you want to keep moving forward? What have you done during this post during quarantine and kind of post quarantine now? Yeah, I think it's really hard to like have any kind of like normalcy. Um, I haven't really had like a normal work experience since March. I know, same. And things have been kind of sporadic as far as things coming back. Like I'll be like, oh, it's coming back. Just had a shoot. And then it like goes dead again. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm one of those people that I actually really thrive in alone time. Mm. So it's actually been much easier for me than I think most people because I feel like I'm very good at knowing what my soul needs. And I think like if you're an artist, your soul gets kind of sick when you're not able to put out um, the inspiration that's inside of you. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, um, like it's, yeah, it's like, it's, if you take in too much inspiration without giving it out, it, it just makes you feel unsettled. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, for me, um, I really feel lucky that I have a lot of other ways of creating that I like to do. Um, I love watercolor painting. I'm not great at it, but I love it. <laughs> um, of course I play guitar as you know. Yeah. Um, I think that it's interesting to see who you stay social with as well in the industry when you feel like, um, it's, it's, you're not checking up on people about work. You're just checking up on people because you're like, Hey, are you doing okay? Are you maintaining your sanity? Yeah, no one is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but no, I know that that is true. That is that has been nice and that has been telling really in a lot of ways to see who has come around and be like, so are you good? You know, um, the truth, I think also too, because everyone understood that no one was really good, if that makes any sense. Like yeah, no creative, no one that was a hair, makeup, photographer, or style, anything. Everybody was sort of like, what is happening? You know, and so I think that it was nice to have so many people reach out and touch base and form Facebook groups and everything just to try and make sure everyone else was sort of okay. You know, that was really nice. That's interesting. I love that you chose, not chose, but um, you already had music, but also we're trying to scratch that creative itch in other areas. I used to explain that to my agent all the time. I would tell him, look, I, obviously I need to make money. If I don't make money, I get pissed. But I was like, but if I'm not, um, but if I don't get to do fun, creative stuff that I feel connected to, like if I don't get to do shoots that I think are truly beautiful and really mm -hmm. proud of, I get irritable. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I find it really affects my mood. It really, really affects my mood if I don't get to do the thing that I love. Cause then I'm like, why am I doing this then? You know what I mean? It's, it's, mm -hmm. you need, you need both those things. You know what I mean? I mean, it's definitely money, but then that other stuff is also wildly important as well. That is fascinating. So what do you think is, first of all, I think you should start a guitar Instagram. I'm just putting that on the side <laughs> there. Just you playing a few little things here and there. I think that's a good idea. And I'm pretty sure my viewers will like it. And I know I will. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. And you know, I actually, I value your opinion and input more than I value most. So I actually really will take that under consideration. Oh, thanks. Oh my goodness. I appreciate that. Same. Um, I also want to know, what do you think, or how do you feel, not just about the current state of the business, but where do you think it's going? Like, what do you see for the future? So this is very interesting. I actually was recently asked by New Beauty Magazine where I thought the industry was going in regards to technology. Mm. And I think like we've both seen a lot of um, hair makeup being replicated by, fixed by, replaced by Photoshop um, in the past 
few years, especially. And I think that circling back to what I was saying about millennials and Gen Z being very aware of what is authentic, Mm -hmm. I think that there will be pushback as far as gaining clients if things don't look real. Yeah. And I think we're also seeing that trend, especially in makeup. And I I don't know if if you're seeing that in hair as well, where the Instagram makeup has very much changed from like being a very Kevin Aquan style painted on situation to being a more artistic editorial expression Mm. and with very few products on the skin. And I think it's interesting that this time has collided with the advance of technology in this area. And so I feel that to some extent, there's no way to completely replace this job, which is comforting. Yeah. But I also think that it has to look different because it can't really exist in the way that it has for the past 20, 30 years. And I remember reading Grace Coddington's, um, her memoir, Autobiography, and she was actually able to draw every single makeup artist in the industry when she started, because there were so few of them. It was like, um, you know, she drew Serge Luton, she, she drew Kevin, and she, she just drew like all those famous 90s makeup artists, because like really that, like that was the extent of who it was. And that was why they were able to pull in such big rates. And like, I think we see like as this market gets oversaturated and then to top it all off to some extent being replaced by technology and then that moving quicker because of COVID. So I think that it's going to have to look different. I think people are going to have to have um, almost like multi-pronged careers. Mm. You know, some people, I think they're really good at being personalities along with being artists. Some people are really good at making product and creating a brand. Um, And I think some people will even do something that's entirely different outside of makeup as just, um, or, or of hair to fully express every part of themselves creatively, but also to supplement income wise. But Something that I said to New Beauty that I think needs to be repeated is that um, camera technology is advancing far faster than um, artificial makeup and hair technology. We're seeing new cameras being put out all the time, like red cameras, like really messed with us for a second. Just like, what are you doing to the colors here? True. And moving image content is more important than ever. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm seeing a higher demand from clients and a higher demand from consumers for moving image content. Everything's video. Yeah. So I think that because of that, it will be at least 10 years before it's like an across the board, normal replacement Mm -hmm. for artists. And honestly, who knows if they'll be able to get away with that. And I think that will depend on what happens to the eye of the consumer will they still value authenticity or will their eye be trained to be drawn to the fake? And I think you see this like a lot, like in Asia, like people being drawn to more like almost like robotic aesthetically. Yeah. But that's very different from like the clients that would be in Europe and America Mm -hmm. who want to see something that looks like them. And I also think that's why you see like a rise of influence Um, of people who are like plus size models and like um, people with disabilities, all that sort of thing. Cause people want to see the reality. They want to see the imperfections and they want to be reminded that it's okay not to be perfect. Yeah, that is true. Oh, I love that. That's true. And that is an interesting point about, I guess our future really does depend on what people are groomed to expect or Mm -hmm. because you're right I feel like right now we're at a weird point I think COVID has accelerated some of the issues that some of the things that were already going to happen in the industry have been pushed further faster because of this because of COVID but I do think that you're right that it's the the public has forced companies to embrace other Mm -hmm. forms of beauty things that are equally beautiful but things that they had shut out because 
for decades, the 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 definition of beauty was so narrow. Mm -hmm. And, and tradi traditional beauty was seen as just being this small when there was really so much of the population that really wasn't taken in. And I like that that has opened up. And, I, and you're right too, I feel like the other thing that is interesting is that the technology to replicate makeup and hair looks cheap and it looks yeah. synthetic. It doesn't look good. And I've seen companies that keep, or like those, uh, is it, what is it called? It's a capture thing with a will replace the heads and whatever and like try and not use models and not use hair and makeup and stuff. But oh yeah, yeah, I've seen the results of that. It looks terrible. It looks terrible, but I mean, who knows? Maybe people will like that in 10 years. I hope not. I, I hope, hope not. not. And I think that the fact that people like do wanna see bodies that look more like them and they, mm -hmm. I feel like people are getting more cognizant of like, comparing the way something looks on a model's body to their own. And that's already hard when you're shopping online. Like I look at someone who like has a very different shape body than me and I'm like confused, like how is this going to fall on me? Mm -hmm. And then like, I could kind of like in my mind, like, okay, like I see where the fabric is gathering on like her, but she has a, like an actual hip, even though her hips are very different than mine. Mm -hmm. And when I see this on what is clearly like a mannequin with like skin put on it, I'm like, I can't, I don't trust this. Yeah. And I think people are also just in general, like annoyed with having to like send things back online. People yeah. just kind of want like a guaranteed, like this is going to fit and look good on a normal person's body. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And everyone shops online. So they need to make that experience user-friendly for everyone, not just for a small segment of the population. It has to be everybody now. And that that is hard to do when there are so many varying body types. That means they do have to like it. I only have honestly one client. I won't name any of my clients because I don't want to make anybody else feel bad. But I only have one client that is really good at having all kinds of different body types and having people that are, like you said, that have disabilities or like the, that variety, I'm always impressed when I work with them and how good they are at like having everything. And, and yeah. it's really, it is, it, it, it's, it, it's cool. It's inspiring and it is beautiful. And it feels good to be part of something like that. I, I enjoy feeling like being part of something that feels inclusive, which is, which is lovely, but that is, that's true. You're right. That is, this is going to be a really interesting next couple of years, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I have to say. So what advice would you give, this is terrible, but I have to make it good, um, <laughs> to an aspiring makeup artist? Because you have had a very interesting, yours is a very unusual story, which I love. Um, but if someone were starting out and were thinking like, oh, I want to do what she does for a living, what advice would you give to that person? I would say, first of all, make a, a clear idea of what type of career you want, but be open to that changing. When I walked into this industry, it was very different than it is now. Mm. And from the jump, I was like, I want to be an editorial artist. But then as I like worked with people, I realized, oh, I actually like love working one-on-one -on -one with celebrity clients. And that changed my portfolio and it changed the direction of my career. I think as you continue to go, you learn what you like and like what you think you like and what you actually like is actually usually very different. Sure. And what you think you want to do and what you're good at and what is what has an ease to it for you will often not be the same. Be open to that changing. And also because not only is this industry just changing fast because it is and because of COVID, I think the whole world, like no matter what you do, you have to be constantly listening and looking around you as the changes are happening. Because the way that technology is moving right now for everybody in every career, it is causing things to change so quickly that careers are changing and disappearing, but then new ones are created very rapidly. 
Yeah. And I think that that will actually speed up even more in the coming years, that we will see technology changing trajectories of careers. And I think it's really important to be aware of what's happening around you, open to change, open to realizing that you may not know yourself as well as you think you do. You may not know what you want as well as you thought you did. I think because this industry is um, forcing people to have to branch out in so many different directions, that will continue. So go ahead and like start out working on set and pursue this, especially if like, if you really want to, it's easy to be cynical right now and say, like, this career is just disappearing, just be an accountant. <laughs> but if, if you really want to do it, I, I can't in good conscience say like, oh, go for the safe route because I don't think that there's such a thing anymore. True. And I think that I saw this a lot like um, in 2008 where young people were like, wow, this recession has caused people to fail at even what they hate to do. So why not try to fail at something we love to do? I love that. So if you want to do this, like do it, but just be open to learning about yourself as you go and be open to carving your own path and trying things just to see if they work. Because I think that now more than ever, I see people just trying stuff that they feel like they love and is missing in the market creates like the biggest success and also the biggest changes to the industry that end up bringing like really beautiful aesthetic changes and um, open people's ideas to more opportunities of what that could look like in the future. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That is really good advice. I love that. Be open to to the change, I do. That's good because that's really hard to do. A lot of people have a set idea of who they want to be, what they want to do, and and can oftentimes be very inflexible about it. Like, are not open mm -hmm. to, hey, actually, my strengths lie somewhere else, or this. I'm banging my head against the wall. This is clearly not working for me. You know? Yeah. Oh wow! Excellent advice. I love that, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. Oh, are you kidding? You're one of my faves. <laughs> any any talk with you is like is an absolute pleasure. I've said this to my roommates, to my friends, like all the time. I'm like, oh man, I love David. He's one of the few people that I just love chatting with on set, and I will actually take his advice. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, same, and also, I'm serious about the guitar Instagram. We'll discuss that afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll come awesome. over. We'll start a jam band. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. I'll be your rhythm guitarist. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Click on her link. I'm going to have it um, underneath this so that you can um, follow her on Instagram. Her work is beautiful. Thanks again, Jimmy.